Welcome and good morning. Presenting to you from the Crumble Research Institute at the University Health Network, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Hello everyone, my name is Mary Ito and I am so happy to be here with you today and to be part of this wonderful event. You know, I have been a journalist uh, and a radio host for a very long time. I mean, a very long time. And I love listening to people's stories. But there's a special place in my heart for scientists and researchers in particular, because these are the people who dedicate their lives to finding answers to some of our biggest problems, including cures for diseases. And I mean, how amazing and cool is that? A few years ago, I organized a free festival called CRAM, and it was to highlight and showcase some of the incredible research going on right here in Toronto. And I had researchers from all four of the city's universities take part. Most importantly, we invited the public too, just everyday people, not scientists, to hear from these experts. And that evolved into a podcast that I host called The Cram Podcast, where I interview Canadian researchers about the most innovative solutions and big ideas that you should know about. And that's super exciting for me. And I do this because I truly believe that if we all better understand and, and support the science that's happening in our cities and in our communities, that's going to make the world a better place. And maybe after today, you might be inspired to become a scientist as well. So this is why I love being a part of this celebration, because we don't often get to hear from scientists themselves about their personal stories as well, how they got to where they are, some of the challenges and accomplishments along the way, and to be honest, about how fun it is being a scientist. Truly. You don't believe me? Well, let's watch this video. I love being a scientist. I get to read about, think about, and do things that I enjoy and I get to problem solve. You have like all these different clues and you're like building a puzzle and then you take a step back and look at the bigger picture and all of a sudden it makes sense. Science is amazing because you get to think about solutions to problems that affect almost everyone in some way. I got into science because I wanted to help people and that's exactly what I'm doing. Science needs everyone. The most passionate, the most curious, and the most ambitious people are of all genders. No matter where we're from, what we look like, and how old we are, innovation needs each and every single one of us. Events like this one are so important because we need to get the word out to young people, and girls in particular, that being a scientist is literally one of the greatest jobs in the world. My career has taken me all over the world. It's really a joy to work in this kind of field that allows for that sort of discovery. If you have a big idea, just go for the big idea. Even if you're scared, just do it. I'm just here to remind you what I know deep down you probably already know, which is work hard and you dream big, anything is possible. Anything is possible. I love that, Amy. And Amy Poehler and Mayim Bialik, I mean, how cool is that? Okay, let's talk about why we're here today. February the 11th is the United Nations official day to recognize and address gender inequality in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields, which is also known as STEM. They designated this day because women are still vastly underrepresented in STEM fields particularly in engineering, computer science, and biomedical research. So the UN's goal, and ours today, is to encourage as many people as possible to consider a career in science, including people of all genders, backgrounds, and affiliations. Diversity is key. Bringing together people from different backgrounds with a variety of experiences and perspectives is what's going to lead to new discoveries. And that's what we want, right? So we've got a lot of exciting stuff for, in store for you today. First up, you're going to hear from three amazing scientists who work right here at the Kremble Research Institute in the areas of brain, 
vision, and arthritis research, and they're each going to tell you what they're working on and about their path to becoming a scientist. Then, after the presentations, we're going to have a panel discussion and a Q&A, and the speakers are going to answer some questions that were submitted from some of you. And we even had, get this, a class email from South Africa. So we're super excited about addressing that. So if you're ready, I'm excited, let's get started. Our first speaker is Dr. Karen Davis. She's a senior scientist with the Cremble Brain Institute at UHN. Dr. Davis studies chronic pain and the brain. And she also happens to be an avid hockey fan. Here's her story. Hi, my name is Karen Davis. I'm a senior scientist at the Cremble Brain Institute. I study pain and the brain. Becoming a scientist was something that was in the back of my mind from an early age. It was a very kind of pivotal moment for me that I had a great biology teacher in high school and he used to always like to tell us what was uh, happening in the research world and big discoveries. And one day he told us that the discovery had been made about something called endorphins and the body's own internal opiate receptors. And actually the people who discovered this won a Nobel Prize. At the time, actually in that biology class, we were studying the brain and we did brain dissections. And so that really um, got me thinking about how the brain controls things and in a good way and sometimes uh, can go wrong in a bad way, leading to all sorts of diseases. And so I was quite intrigued by that. I learned how to skate and to play hockey when I was in my mid thirties. I had a friend who was a really good hockey player who said to me one day, you should be skating and playing and she couldn't teach me. She said, you need professional help. So I enrolled in, in some classes with five-year-olds and, uh, and then I started to play. I've had many, many, many hockey injuries over the years, for sure, you know, I fall all the time. What captured my interest initially was that somehow um, you might be able to control dealing with pain in, in, a, in a period of time um, on your own through what's, what's in your brain. And it was also fascinating to me that everybody experiences pain differently. Those are the things that kind of really motivated me to try to understand, you know, why do we have this issue? I love being a scientist for a variety of reasons. One is I get to read about, think about, and do things about stuff that's really fun and that I enjoy. And I often give the analogy that, that um, being a scientist is like playing academic baseball. If you're a hitter, if you succeed only 30% of the time, you're a superstar. If you have a batting average of 300, you're like a superstar. It means you fail 70% of the time. And it's kind of like that in science, that you can fail a lot and still be a superstar and still make a huge contribution to science. So it's really a joy to work in, in this kind of field that allows for that sort of discovery. Well, my mother and grandmother have had a huge impact on me. My mother is still alive. She's 92. She's amazing and she's still sharp. And my grandmother passed away when I was 16, but I had a very close relationship with her. They were very strong women and were very bright. They were very impactful um, in their encouragement of, of me uh, and support of me to do what I wanted to do, what I liked to do. I created um, an entry scholarship to somebody, a girl, who's first generation in their family to go uh, study at the University of Toronto uh, in the Faculty of Engineering. I also created it to honor my grandmother and, and mother who didn't have opportunities to go to university but were extremely bright and engaged women. My message to each and every, every one of you really is you can do it. You need an interest and you need passion. Follow your dreams. Hi, my name is Karen Davis, and I'm a neuroscientist at the Krimble Brain Institute. I'm so happy to be here today to tell you about my work. I study the brain to understand pain, why we have it, and hopefully one day how to stop chronic pain. Now, you probably recognize Lady Gaga, who's talked about her struggles with chronic pain. But in this photo, she doesn't really look like she's in pain. I think she looks pretty happy. Now, you may know some people in your life who also hide how, how they are really feeling. So you don't always know if somebody is in pain unless they tell you, because you can't actually see pain. That's the focus of my work, to understand pain. 
Now, as you heard in the video, I'm a big sports fan, particularly hockey. And years ago, I started to wonder why different people feel and cope with pain differently, especially when they have something important to focus on, like scoring a goal, goal or reading, studying, doing chores, or just doing something fun. Do you ever watch a game and your favorite player gets tripped or poked or checked, but just gets up and skates away? I found it fascinating that some people seem to be more affected by pain and others seem to be able to just brush it off. And that's why I decided to study the brain in people who have pain. Now pain, particularly chronic pain, can be hard to treat. And we have to depend on what a person is telling us about what they're feeling. So what I'm trying to work on is to understand how the brain is organized and how it works. There are some brain systems for pain that are similar in everybody, but they work a little bit differently for each of us. These differences are really important because if we can understand what makes us all a little bit different, we can find a way to treat pain that best suits each person's brain. Maybe different types of drugs, surgery that work on different parts of the brain, or other types of treatment. In my lab, we study the brain using two large pieces of equipment called scanners. The one showing here is called an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And we use it to look at what the brain uh, looks like and how it functions. Now we use another type of scanner shown here, which is called a MEG or magnetic encephalography scanner. And this measures brain activity a thousand times a second. And this tells us how different parts of the brain uh, work over time. Now we use these machines to find out how the brain is organized and what is happening when people feel pain. And when in some people, they prioritize doing a task instead of focusing on pain. Our goal is to understand what is not working well in the brains of people suffering from chronic pain and where the problem is so that we may be able to try to find a way to fix it. Now, right now, you've been watching a video of my brain. That's right, as a scientist, you get to image your own brain. So the colors in the slide I just showed you of my own brain indicate how areas of my brain are connected to each other through what's called white matter connections. These are kind of like the highways and roads that takes information to and from cities and neighborhoods. This is really important to coordinate brain activity within the so-called gray matter that contains the neurons or nerve cells. And just like different cities and neighborhoods and different buildings, all the different functions of the brain happen here. And in some brain areas, just like some buildings, they're specialized for one particular function, maybe uh, vision or movement, but other functions and perceptions like pain are not created in a single brain area, but come about because of activity in many areas that are connected and coordinated by the highways of the brain to create networks. Now, my lab has made discoveries about these pain networks, which has been a really exciting journey for me and my students. For example, we found that the brain's highways and cities and coordination is different in people who focus on pain than in people who prioritize and focus on a task. This could be why people like Mitch Marner can focus to play hockey and how some people can cope with chronic pain so that they can do their jobs, household things, or even enjoy a hobby. Most of the time, pictures of brain imaging studies show colorful images of the places where activity is going on. But behind the scenes, scientists like me are looking deeper into the timing and details of that activity that can be different or the same throughout the brain, kind of like different clocks that are set to different time zones. The picture I showed you of a MEG machine helps us to understand the timing of the brain. Now, when brain cells called neurons are in synchrony, in sync, like these rowers working together, then that area of the brain can work more efficiently. This is something that happens all the time in your brain, but sometimes when your brain is not working effectively or is injured, there is some disorganization in the system and this can cause some problems. For example, my lab found that brain, there are brain imaging, sorry, brain timing problems in some people with chronic pain, and we hope to figure out how to get the brain working in a more coordinated fashion through different treatments. The bottom line is that we each have a unique brain, kind of like a fingerprint, and no two brains are exactly the same, just as no two people are exactly the same. I also wanted to let you know that there's so much more to being a scientist that is really exciting. 
I've had great opportunities outside the lab and wanted to mention a few things here. About 15 years ago, I noticed that many science students did not feel very connected to the science community, and they did not um, uh, know much about the ethical issues that are important to do science. So I worked with some colleagues to create a graduate student oath. Now, this is kind of like the Hippocratic oath that medical doctors recite. But this oath is recited by all students starting graduate studies in the Institute of Medical Science at the University of Toronto. And the students are also provided training in research ethics. I also have a strong interest in ethical ways to study and treat pain. And together with some wonderful collaborations, we gathered this information into a book. I also wanted to make sure that brain imaging is used properly to study the brain and pain and to protect this very personal information. So I worked with people around the world to develop guidelines to help people doing brain imaging and people who use the information. Finally, I wanted to mention that no matter what your background is, it's important to follow your passions and what you feel are important to society, like things that improve the equity, diversity and inclusiveness or EDI of people working and studying science being included in research. So I was really proud to be named the first female editor in chief of the top international journal in my field. Having this position and working with other people at the helm of other journals has already been an amazing experience because we're working together to not only raise awareness of EDI, but also to ensure that science and publishing is more equitable, open, and inclusive for all. Now you heard in the video that my parents and grandparents did not have the opportunity to go to university. And when I was in high school, I had no idea how far that I could go and how much of the world would change to allow me to follow my dreams and passions. But the world has changed and continues to improve, especially if we all work towards that. I've traveled the world and met some really incredibly fascinating people. What I love most about science is how it's really changing for the better um, to be more inclusive for people like me and others who previously could not follow their dreams. This is my partner, Susan. She's been with me throughout this journey and has been my support and cheerleader for 30 years. Hope you enjoyed hearing about my journey and I encourage you to think about a career in science. Thank you. That was terrific. I love that, Karen. In particular, I really love that MRI of your brain and all the colors and everything. I think you could do a Netflix special called Inside Karen's Brain. Yeah, you can work on that. Okay, our next speaker is Amina Adama. She's a PhD student in the CVAC lab, which is at the Donald K. Johnson Eye Institute at UHN. Amina is a huge fan of detective stories and shows like CSI and Bones, maybe you are too, and she says that she actually feels a lot like a detective when she's working in the lab. Let's watch this video to learn more about Amina's story. Hi, um, my name is Amina Adama, and I am a fourth-year PhD student in Dr. Jeremy Sivak's lab at the Donald K. Johnson Eye Institute. Our lab studies neurodegeneration Neurons are what allow your brain to send signals throughout your body for you to do a lot, like basically everything that you do, whether it's seeing, speaking, eating, anything like that, movement. Over time, they degenerate. And the ones that are part of the central nervous system, which is made up of the brain, the eyes, and the spinal cord, don't regenerate. So a lot of research goes into one, kind of looking into why they don't regenerate, and then two, solving the different diseases that happen because they don't regenerate. And glaucoma is one of those diseases. Currently, there's no cure for it. All you can do at this point is really kind of manage it to try to slow that progression to total blindness. Coming into the lab every morning, I set a goal in terms of an experiment that I want to complete. I'll open my lab notebook and write out, today I'm going to do X, Y, Z. <laughs> Maybe while you're running something or incubating cells or something like that, you'll just come out for an hour and then go get lunch and then go back in and finish. And then by the end of the day, you just kind of look at the data you've accumulated for the day. So it's, it's a lot of patience, definitely. I'm originally from Ghana. Ghana is an equatorial country. It's very, very, very sunny over there. 
glaucoma is very prevalent in Ghana, basically. Um, a lot of people have it. A lot of people get it. A lot of people in my family have it and get it. Part of what inspired me to study what I'm studying now in terms of glaucoma is um, tying it back to where I came from. It would make me feel very proud because being like a child of immigrants, my parents spent their entire life basically working for me and my siblings to be able to do what we're doing now. They say it all the time, like, you're living the dream of like the life that I wanted to live. So it would make me feel proud that I'm kind of like paying homage to my parents and my grandparents and everyone that came before me to allow me to be doing what I'm doing today. So what I would say to young students that are watching today is don't limit yourself. Just try not to think small and keep an open mind. And especially like being a girl, it can be hard to try to go into spaces like science and STEM because you think that, you know, like I don't really see people that look like me doing this kind of thing. Am I even qualified to do it? And um, I would say that even if you're scared, just do it. If you have a big idea, just go for the big idea. As long as you are pursuing it and you make it known that you are pursuing it, the universe will help you find it. Hi everyone, it's so great to see all of you. Um, as you heard, my name is Amina Adama and I am a fourth year PhD student at the Donald K. Johnson uh, I Institute. Today, I will tell you a little story about my journey as a scientist. So here's a picture of me at about five years old. For as long as I can remember, I always wanted to become a doctor, specifically a pediatrician after a mentor and a family friend who was also a pediatrician. Funny enough, I ended up changing my mind one day when our local university came to present at our school and started to talk about forensics, which was new to me. As someone that's always liked shows like Criminal Minds, Law and Order and CSI, I didn't know this type of scientific investigation was something you could actually study. And it really sparked my interest. These years were arguably the most important in me becoming who I am today because it inspired my interest in investigative analysis and chasing conclusions through clues. This led me to where I am today, studying a group of eye diseases called glaucoma. Now I want you all to look at this picture here and play a little game along with me. Imagine one day you're walking down the street, maybe going to your friend's house or just taking a walk, and you notice that your sight seems a little bit different. Nothing major, just slight. Now this describes what glaucoma is. Glaucoma is a group of incurable eye diseases that together make up the leading cause of irreversible blindness worldwide. It starts so subtly that you may not even notice it, but a major clinical feature is a progression to, of tunnel vision that happens over time. Little by little, by little. Unfortunately, by the time it gets to this stage, it's too late and the loss of vision cannot be restored. And if you imagine living daily life like this, you can see how only being able to see a small part of every beautiful picture in front of you would be really difficult. Now that's where scientists like me come in. So this is a diagram of the human eye and this tissue outlined here at the back of the eye is your retina. Which, and this uh, is actually what's allowing you to see my presentation right now. Now, the exact cause of glaucoma is unclear, but what we do know is that a major part of the disease and what makes it worse is the loss of these cells right here. These little green cells are called retinal ganglion cells or RGCs. RGCs are very important for your eyesight because they take in the visual information that comes into your eye from all of the other cell types in the retina and they send it to your brain so that you can understand what you're looking at. RGCs are also neurons. And unfortunately, these types of neurons, once damaged and dead, cannot regenerate, like for example, skin cells. A very important aspect of my research is involved into looking into things like this to see if we can save these cells from dying before it gets to the stage of being completely dead. Here's a real life picture of a retinal uh, ganglion cell culture. These are the RGCs here in green and white. And these red cells here are called astrocytes. One of the jobs of astrocytes is to support RGCs by keeping them healthy with nutrients. Our lab discovered that in the retina, astrocytes can actually send out a fat molecule called lipoxin B4 or LXB4 that when around damaged RGCs, 
can repair them and make them healthier than before. Now that's great, right? Well, here comes the investigation, the investigative part. We don't know how exactly LXB4 is doing this. This was the first time we had seen something like this. And in order for us to use this in a hospital setting to help patients with blindness, we needed to investigate and put together the clues of what's going on here. And now comes the fun part. So my project surrounds this question. How is LXB4 saving these retinal ganglion cells from death? Answering this question has led me to many different opportunities, one of them being genetic manipulation. This is DNA, the building blocks of life. DNA is what makes you and I humans, what makes us look different, and what separates you from being a human being versus, say, a banana. As a neuroscientist, we get the power to manipulate DNA in different systems to help us answer our questions. To study a gene, we can block its function and then see if our cells survive when we try to damage them. Kind of like playing Clue, you know, to figure out the culprit of our question. In the future, I want to take what I've learned and apply it on a bigger scale. I'm originally from Ghana, an equatorial country halfway across the world. Glaucoma is a major issue in countries like Ghana and across Africa. Amongst Africans, glaucoma begins earlier and is more aggressive and is the second leading cause of blindness across the continent. Eventually, I would like to go back home and use what I've learned to help answer these questions and help people like me. It's interesting to look back now at the girl you see here. If you had told me back then that I'd become this person, traveling the world and talking about my research, I probably would have laughed, but yet here I am. The message I want to leave you all with today is that you should follow your interests. As an African kid, we're often told that the only careers that exist for us are being a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer. Had I not followed my interest of investigative analysis and forensics, I probably wouldn't have been able to do such cool work today as a scientist. Take my story as an example and do the same for yourself. Ask yourself what really interests and motivates you and follow that passion. Because if you follow that passion, it may just lead you to your destiny. Thank you. That was terrific, Amina. And you certainly get the best baby picture award for sure. And I was really touched about, you know, your journey uh, going from a child and then having an interest in glaucoma, eye research, and then to becoming the scientist you are today. So all the best with your career. Our final speaker this morning is Laura Passalent. Uh, she's a clinician, investigator, and advanced practice physiotherapist in the Schroeder Arthritis Institute at the UHN. Laura is also a world traveler, and you're going to hear all about her big adventures and her science journey. Take a look. Hi, I'm Laura Passalens. I'm an advanced practice physiotherapist working in rheumatology at the Schroeder Arthritis Institute. I think I always knew that I wanted to do something in the healthcare field. You know, I bounced around between should I go into medicine, should I get into nursing, and my mother's like, well, why are you thinking these other things? Like, why don't you get into rehab? And so one thing led to another, and I ended up getting into the University of Toronto. So the ultimate goal for um, patients who are receiving physiotherapy is really to maximize their function and optimize their quality of life. And as a physiotherapist, you're there to guide them and to help them on that journey. I'd worked in many different areas within the hospital, but I felt that I needed more of a change, more of an adventure. So I ended up in Kiribati, which is a group of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And I ended up volunteering with an organization called Voluntary Services Overseas. Kiribati is made up of many islands. And even within the main island, there are still more rural areas where people couldn't access the services that were available at the central hospital. And so because of that, there was a big gap in terms of care. What we started to do is develop sort of a community-based rehabilitation service where once a week we would go out into the community and particularly these rural areas that couldn't access the hospital and start to sort of assess the need. And we started to collect statistics because nobody had really understood, you know, what the population with disabilities was. We were able to present this to the Ministry of Health to help advocate for this community and for people with disabilities living in Caribous. I think what it taught me is 
you know, like the impact that you can have when you look at populations and communities at large, it can be quite substantial and it can be quite life-changing for groups of people, not just an individual. What I love about my job and what I do as an advanced practice physiotherapist is that it's not just physiotherapy. It is teaching, it is research, it's working in a team environment. I may be in clinic one day, assessing patients to try and understand what their joint pain is caused by. I may be treating patients and teaching them exercises in terms of how to better manage their back pain. There's so many different aspects of my job that are different every day. If I had to go back to my 16-year-old self and say, what advice would I give myself? It would be that you're gonna make mistakes and you're going to learn from those mistakes. You may have a path that you think you're gonna set yourself straight on and that that's the path you're gonna take through life, but that path is gonna have many forks in the road and those forks are gonna take you into incredible places. Hi, my name's Laura, and I'm so excited to be here to share my story with you. As you heard, I'm a physiotherapist, and as a physiotherapist, I assess and treat conditions, illnesses, and injuries to make the most of a person's movement and function and to prevent disability. My career has taken me all over the world, including a tiny group of islands in the Central Pacific most have never heard of called Kiribati. Initially, I worked in the central hospital treating adults and children with different types of health problems. But similar to Canada, people who lived outside the urban center of the island had difficulty assessing doctors and nurses, especially people with disabilities. I started to realize there were gaps in the healthcare system that made it difficult for some people to get the care that they needed. Rather than expecting patients to come to us at the hospital, we decided to go to them. We may have provided very simple care, such as teaching someone with an amputation how to walk with crutches, but these small interventions had a big impact on people's lives. During my time in Kiribati, I worked in partnership with my colleagues and the community with disabilities to provide regular community outreach, promote community organization, and advocate for sustainability to train local nurses as physios to continue to provide care to people with disabilities living in the more rural and remote parts of the country. Based on this experience, I realized as a physiotherapist that I could shift from traditional practice, such as treating an individual patient in a clinical setting, to addressing the needs of whole communities of people with disabilities. I didn't realize it at the time, but the time I spent in Kiribati would change the direction of my career. When I returned to Canada, I was again working in a hospital setting, but realized I was wanting more in terms of where my career could take me. I ended up going back to school to get a master's degree in epidemiology, which is the study of health and disease in populations. This education provided me with the skills and tools to look at the healthcare system and patients with a more objective and critical lens. I also gained additional physiotherapy training to allow me to work beyond my traditional skills as a physio. I eventually landed in the world of rheumatology, working with patients with autoimmune conditions that affect joints, including a disease called axial spondyloarthritis. That's a mouthful, eh? Axial spondyloarthritis is a form of inflammatory arthritis that affects young adults, but it can also affect children. It results in back pain and stiffness and can cause swollen joints in the arms and legs. Axial spinal arthritis can make it difficult for people to get dressed in the morning, sit at school, play sports, or hang out with their friends. Trying to diagnose axial spinal arthritis amongst more common forms of back pain, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. You can't see the inflammation in your back the way you might see a swollen knee or a swollen wrist. So it can be difficult for doctors and other healthcare providers to know the cause of the back pain. In fact, it can take up to nine years for people to get diagnosed with axial spondyloarthritis, during which time they are suffering in pain, missing school or work, and not able to enjoy the things they want to do. 
I found myself looking at the healthcare system from a very broad perspective. Similar to Kiribis, I saw gaps in the healthcare system. This time, I saw there weren't enough doctors to assess patients with this condition, not enough awareness by healthcare providers to quickly identify the disease and have people diagnosed in a timely manner. There had to be a better way. It was time to shake things up, cause a little disruption and challenge the status quo. So what is disruption? It's thinking outside the box. It's a way of looking at problems from a different perspective and thinking of creative solutions. There are many examples of disruption in science, including 3D printing organs like skin and blood vessels to help people in need of transplant. Another example is using a medication like methotrexate, which is traditionally used in chemotherapy for certain cancers, but in low doses is a very effective treatment for people with autoimmune conditions like rheumatoid arthritis. Disruption in healthcare is also expansion of traditional healthcare roles. You may recall I got advanced training as a physiotherapist. What this means is I was working beyond the traditional skills as a physio. As an advanced practice physiotherapist, I order and interpret blood tests, x-rays, MRIs, and other investigations. I'm able to diagnose and make treatment recommendations for people with conditions affecting the muscles, bones, and joints, including axial spondyloarthritis. Now, I want you to imagine that you're a 25-year-old and you start to experience back pain. After a few weeks of not getting better, you go to your family doctor, who then sends you to a chiropractor, but it doesn't really help. You have to stop playing hockey with your friends, and you go back to your doctor, who gives you medications that don't really take your pain away. You then get sent to a surgeon who says, you're not a surgical candidate. So now you have to take time off work because of your pain. Eventually, you're referred to a rheumatologist who's a doctor who specializes in autoimmune diseases. But there aren't enough rheumatologists, so you end up waiting a long time before you're finally seen, receive a diagnosis, and start treatment that makes you feel better. When you look back, you realize that this journey has taken years. The question is, why is this happening? And how can we do it better? With my skills in epidemiology and advanced practice, along with my physician colleagues, we set out to create a new pathway to diagnose people with axial spondyloarthritis. We were able to see patients within one month of, time, of the time that they were referred, compared to the wait times of six months to two years to see a rheumatologist. We were also able to shorten time to diagnosis for people living with back pain from nine years to two years. But how is this science? Looking at how the healthcare system works and how patients navigate the system is science. It's called health services research that studies how age, gender, where you live, what you do for a living, affect how you access the right healthcare provider at the right time and in the right place. It studies the quality of healthcare, cost of healthcare, and how well the healthcare system helps people's health and well being. My journey into science started on that little island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and I've been involved with health service research over the last 20 years. The moral of this story is disruption's not a bad thing. It's how we evolve, it's how we make change, it's how we discover new things. Look around you and do the science. Be creative, be bold, challenge the status quo, make friends and be part of the team and speak loudly, plan, develop, implement, evaluate and do the science. Have those adventures, open your heart and mind to new experiences. Do the science, you never know where it will take you. Thanks for listening to my story. Thank you, Laura. What a terrific talk. I, and I just love how your world travels have inspired uh, your researcher and uh, your research, I should say, and the scientists who you are today. So thanks again. I think all the talks we've heard have been fascinating and inspiring. It's, it's wonderful that we can get a peek into these scientists' worlds and also brains. And I hope you think so, too. Okay, now we have a very special special message from Marcy Ian. She's the Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth, and she wanted to share a few words on this special day. So take it away, Marcy. 
Hi everyone, my name is Marcy Ian. I'm Canada's Minister for Women and Gender Equality and Youth and Member of Parliament for Toronto Centre. One of my absolute favourite parts of being Minister of Youth is being fortunate enough to travel across Canada to talk with incredible young people such as yourselves about the power of education and what it can do for your future. It opens the door for young and brilliant minds like yours to tackle some of the greatest challenges facing us today. And science is a powerful vehicle toward achieving this impactful goal. So, if I can leave you with one piece of advice, it's this. Follow your passion unapologetically. Seek and give mentorship wherever you can because with that comes many invaluable lessons and resources. The power that comes from working hard and working together is limitless. You can do this. I believe in you. Thank you so much, Marcy. We'll certainly take those words to heart. Okay, it is time now for our Q&A. So Karen, uh, Amina, Laura, you're going to join me back here on screen and we're going to get right to those questions. Our first question is from Mrs. Ja Young Kim's grade 7 and 8 class from Sir Samuel Steele Public School. Yay, thanks for joining us. And they want to know, what inspired all three of you to go into science specifically? You know, what drove your interest in science? So I'm wondering, Amina, if you'd like to start first. Yeah, sure. That's a really great question. Uh, I would say for me personally, what inspired me was the love of exploration. I was drawn to the, and especially in terms of what I'm currently studying, I was drawn to the field of glaucoma because I have such a close connection to it in terms of my personal life and family and being able to work um, towards treatments for a disease that I see my loved ones suffering from makes my work really worthwhile. Okay, terrific. And Karen, what about you? Yeah, well, actually, when I was in junior high and high school, I was much more drawn to math than um, and even the early developments mm -hmm. back then of computer programming than I was to science. Um, I was actually really good at math, but I actually really disliked a lot of what was uh, being taught and, and uh, we had to do in biology class because in those days, uh, we had dissections of things that I don't like very much, like worms and bugs and frogs. Uh, so, you know, I had to endure uh, those science classes. But then when we got to studying the brain, that really engaged me. And that really uh, drew me to, uh, to go into science. Yeah, I remember those dissection classes too. <laughs> but you struggled through those and found your passion. So that's great. Uh, Laura, what about you? You know, growing up, I remember being very observant of the world around me. And, you know, I, I remember my mom, she might misplace something in the house and like a scarf or something in some obscure place. And she'd say, Laura, where is it? And I always knew exactly where things were. So I think I've always had sort of an attention to detail about the world around me. And, and I think that that observation and curiosity about how things work and, you know, how we can make them better has sort of been with me all through my journey. So I think it's that lifelong curiosity is what really has driven me. That's a very practical skill. I could use you in my house because I lose things <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay, we've got two questions from Mrs. Jessie Stagg, uh, her, Mrs. Jessie Stagg's grade five, six gifted class from Pringle Creek Public School in Whitby, Ontario. Here's the first one. Technology and scientific advancements have moved very quickly over the past few decades. I'll say, uh, what is your projection of advancements in your field over the next several decades and over the next 100 years? Wow. I'm going to give that one to Karen. Wow. 100 years. Well, that's a long time. I'm actually really optimistic that there's, there's going to be really big breakthroughs in many areas of science and medicine, um, partly because there's been tremendous advances in technology and creativity of the people working in science, math, and technology, which is really at the core of all this. What I've already seen in neuroscience is that many uh, diseases and disorders that we thought to have no known uh, causes are now being understood because we have the tools to study the brain in ways that weren't possible when I was in high school. Another important um, change is the advancements that have allowed us to move from 
you know, treating disease and uh, in, med in medicine from kind of a one size fits all model where everybody gets the same treatment to uh, something called personalized medicine, where a, a treatment is kind of tailored to something specific in that person. Um, and this is already happening in cancer and it's being developed in other areas uh, to treat uh, neurological conditions as well. Oh, that's wonderful that it's so hopeful and, and, and positive. Thanks very much, Karen. Okay, this question, my goodness, you have to be a little bit of a wizard of the future to answer this one. Um, do you think there will ever be a cure for physiological or physical disabilities that are currently incurable? Well, I got to give that one to Laura. Well, well, like Karen, I'm I'm going to be an optimist and I'm going to say Yes. And I think that if we look back at how science has had a role in the prevention of disease and disability, you know, I think we're in a good place. Like if we look back, you know, the role of antibiotics over the last hundred years, it's it's been a game changer. Vaccines, you know, if you think about their impact on diseases like polio, it's it's eradicated disability in that sense. Um, simple things, you know, like um, ramps, for example, to allow people in wheelchairs to get into shops and stores and buildings. So I think if we look back, we, we certainly have a history of really changing the way people interact in the world. So if you were to ask me if there is to be a cure for, for all these different things that we encounter in a day to day, whether it's disease or disability, I, I would say yes, for sure. History has taught us that it's possible. Oh, fantastic. All right. Thanks very much. Um, and now we've got a question from Ms. Amanda's students from the uh, Craig Kielberger Secondary School in Milton, Ontario. And they would like to know, aside from doing well in school, how should aspiring scientists prepare for their future if they're not yet certain what path they want to take? Yeah, good question. Okay, Amina, how about uh, that question for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I would say, at least personally, from my experience, that you should just try to uh, look for opportunities in your community. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask around, you know, your parents, your family, friends, your teachers, they're all different types of resources. And you never really know who they could know that uh, could link to whatever it is that you're specifically interested in. And also, when all else fails, uh, you can always use the power of the internet. I mean, I came across my current program just trying to search online um, through a simple Google search. So you'd be really surprised what you'd find. Okay, thanks so much, Amina. Now, our next question comes to us uh, all the way from the Innovation Hub in Bindura, Zimbabwe. And they ask, what strategies can the Innovation Hub introduce to improve the culture of innovation in Bindura? That's a that's a very interesting question to me. So I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to share a couple of thoughts on that because um, over the years, I think I've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of scientists. And one thing, uh, well, a couple of things that I notice. Um, the first thing is that uh, I think with a lot of them uh, who are particularly innovative, they're very open minded. You know, of course, they're curious, as Laura was saying earlier, uh, but they're just open minded and they may have a certain goal, a research goal that they have. But then sometimes they'll see something outside of that goal. It'll be accidental, but they realize, oh, my goodness, like this is a discovery. So they're open minded about that. And also they're willing to accept other points of views. So I, I'm really big on this whole multidisciplinary approach. And I don't know, um, maybe Karen, can you can you speak to any of that? Yeah, absolutely, and and I think uh, you you you're dead on correct about uh, multidisciplinary approach um, because what I've seen is that you know innovation uh, most often occurs when you connect ideas from one field uh, to another. So, for example, uh, the brain imaging that I do and that I was talking to you about today, um, using an MRI or magnetic resonance imaging scanner. That hadn't been invented um, yet when I was in high school, even in my early days of, uh, in university, hadn't been invented. Uh, but it was interesting because there was a technology uh, that we used in chemistry class called NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. Uh, and that was used by chemists, actually, to figure out the chemical composition of, of something that they were studying. Right. Um, 
nothing to do with the brain really. But then suddenly um, people used that technology and this idea to eventually create a machine that could produce pictures of the human body, right? So uh, learning about different fields and connecting with uh, and interacting with people uh, in different fields is really important uh, to drive in innovation. Um, I, I, I thought about this a, a lot um, over the years and um, uh, some time ago, I'd actually set up a program to uh, kind of a social program uh, to bring uh, together engineers and brain surgeons and radiologists. Those are the doctors that look at x-rays and MRIs. And when I brought them together um, in a lot of social um, um, uh, events so that they can kind of talk to each other and help each other with ideas to tackle uh, technical and medical issues from different points of view. Um, uh, so I think I think that's that's something that we we need to do more of and get to know people in other fields, and that will certainly drive innovation. Yeah, well, well said, Karen. Thank you. Um, okay, we got another question. This is from Madame Klink's class from the Milne Valley Middle School in North York, Ontario. Um, this is a really I think this is a great question, and I'm glad they brought it up because some. Sometimes the path to becoming a scientist isn't always smooth, right? So they're asking, what was the biggest challenge, the biggest challenge that you encountered as you worked to achieve your goal? Um, Laura, let me let me start with you. So, yeah, you, definitely we encounter challenges every day, and and one that comes to mind is sometimes you're you're going to encounter skeptics, so people who maybe don't. You know, they question what you do, or maybe they doubt what you do. And certainly, I've I've had my encounter with uh, skepticism along the way. And and skepticism is good in a way because it does challenge us in a good way um, to kind of think about what we're doing and how we're doing it. But along those lines, skepticism and and skeptics, I think you need to balance it off with your champions, the people that support you and lift you and really encourage you on your pathway. And I think that's sort of the way to, um, you know, deal with the skeptics in your life by surrounding you with people that really believe in you. And so that for me is it's my family, it's my parents, my siblings, my husband and my children. And um, it's, it's also my friends and colleagues. So, you know, they've really provided a lot of love and support and I think without that you just it's it's easy to deal with the skeptics when you know that you have a team behind you supporting you so that's that's what I would say in terms of what my challenge has been but also how I've combated that challenge yeah no so true couldn't agree with you more uh, Amina what about you biggest challenge I for in terms of my biggest challenge especially being so early in my career I think the biggest challenge I've probably come across would be maybe um, imposter syndrome. So, I, I mean, like going into a, a field as a scientist, especially just coming out of um, undergraduate school, you, you're surrounded by literally world experts. You know, you're surrounded by people who are um, the top experts of their field, who they've been studying all of these different pathways and diseases for decades they like longer than you've even been alive and you kind of go into it thinking to yourself like am I really qualified to be able to be studying all of these things and uh, you'll you'll do your experiments and then you plan out everything and theoretically it all makes sense but then I, I don't know something goes wrong or, or or it just doesn't work and I think that um one, one of the biggest lessons that I've learned so far uh, especially is to not take those uh, moments of, say, an experiment not working as a reflection of myself and my abilities. A science in itself is a very uh, kind of, um, it's a very uh, logical field in the sense that you're constantly working and working and working as you get to different conclusions. And while every um, you may keep getting, say, the answer that you're not looking for, that could be leading you to an even greater discovery. So I would say just to um, keep in general an open mind and going into anything, especially just being new at what you're trying to do, focus on uh, the reason of why you're doing it. And and yeah, I, I think that's definitely what, what I would say for that. Well, I, I think your answer spoke to a lot of people because I think a lot of us have suffered from imposter syndrome. So yeah, that hit home too. Thanks, Amina. 
Okay, Karen, what about you, biggest challenge? Yeah, so yeah, I agree uh, with uh, Laura and Amina. I, I, I have the same experiences. And you know, imposter syndrome, you know, I've had the uh, pleasure of, of meeting and knowing some Nobel Prize winners, and you know, they too have imposter syndrome. So, <laughs> so that's just something that that we just all have, and that it doesn't necessarily uh, uh, change. And and actually, having a bit of humility and and so self doubt isn't always a horrible thing, right? You have to um, be able to question always um, your findings and your science, um, and not be overconfident because. You know that science advances when when you you know kind of think well is that is that correct or or not um, but um, I think um, a, a challenge uh, you know when you both spoke about this is also kind of confidence um, in your own opinion and that's part of the 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 imposter syndrome issue is you, you have to try to be really confident um, in uh, the the fact that you know you do know what you're doing and you do have a valid opinion, because you've spent a long time studying and reading and learning about something. Um, and it, it's also interesting when you think about the Nobel Prize winners, um, if you go back and you look at the work that they did that um, led to their Nobel Prize, usually the, the big ideas um, and the innovation took place when they were um, earlier in their career, and then they developed. And most of the time, they faced um, uh, a bit of uh, rejection from other people or journals where they tried to publish, um, even the people who um, created uh, the, the mRNA technology that was used uh, for the vaccine uh, development for COVID-19 faced a lot of uh, challenges early in their, in their career that people didn't, you know, didn't think that this was something important or something innovative. So I think um, just to, to know that, you know, you have just as much creativity um, and um, and value in your opinion as 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 anybody else. Now you should listen to other people, of course, and you can learn a lot. And uh, constructive criticism uh, really helps shape all of our ideas. But but just to you know be confident in 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 your opinion. But it, that that has been a challenge. I think it's a challenge for me. It's been it's usually a challenge for pretty much everybody in science. Yeah, no, no, that was terrific. Yeah, thanks so much for that that thoughtful answer, Karen. Um, okay, that wraps up the questions from the classes. I wonder if all of you would be game to do a really fun, quick round of "Would you rather." Are you okay with that? Sure. We just sure. have a little for it. Sure. Yeah, because I think, I think I think everybody watching would really enjoy that. So, all right, uh, just a few seconds left. But Laura, would you rather take up knitting as a hobby or beekeeping? Uh, definitely beekeeping. I think okay, why? Okay, so, so it's, I think that beekeeping is probably one of my future goals that I want to do maybe when I retire, but bees are fascinating. The, the hives, all the different roles that the bees have and from the, the time that they're born to when they die, they, they go through all these different roles and, and duties within the hive. And the other thing that's cool about bees is that in the hive, all the workers, the queen, they're all female. And here we are, women and girls in science. How yep. cooler could that be, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And also, bees, they, they need our help because they're, oh, many yes. are in danger of those species. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, love it. Um, Karen, oh, this is such a tough question for you. Would you rather go to a concert or a hockey game? <laughs> okay. Well, now you caught me in quite a dilemma, but, but actually, you know, there's always another hockey game. There's 82 games in, in the NHL season. So you can always go to another game, but a concert, you know, if it's somebody, uh, an artist that I really love or have never seen, um, sometimes that's a once in a lifetime um, opportunity or it might not come up very often. So generally I would choose the concert. Also, if I have good seats, that helps too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's the clincher. Well-reasoned. I like that. And finally, Amina, would you rather have a guest spot on Law and Order or Stranger Things? Oh, interesting. Yeah. You know, as fun as it might be to kind of chase down creatures in the upside down, I think I'd have to go with Law and Order. <laughs> oh. I think it'd be really cool to just like, 
be a detective for a day and then just go about solving crimes and that kind of thing, going through the investigative analysis. You know, kind of, it, it would almost be like looking at a glimpse of my life if I had taken a different journey. So I think that'd be really interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, in a sense, you are, you're doing that in the lab, right? You're, sol exactly. you're solving puzzles of research. So, exactly. so <laughs> great I have skills. Thanks to all of you. That was a lot of fun. Um, and that's all the time we have for today. It went by so quickly. I just want to thank everyone who joined us, uh, whether you're in school or maybe you're watching from home. Thank you for participating. It means a lot to all of us. And I hope you enjoyed the talks and enjoyed learning about what it's really like to be a scientist. A lot of work and planning went into this event and working with the speakers. So Big thank you, big shout out to the Kremble team, Carly McPherson, Heather Sherman, Twain Pereira, Dr. Amy Ma, Sarah Yuan, and Lynn Saber for helping to organize today's event. We loved working with you. And of course, huge thank you as well to our wonderful speakers, Dr. Karen Davis, Amina Adama, and Laura Pasolent. You, you all spoke so eloquently and compellingly, and um, I thought I had the best job, but I think you might have the best job as well. Also, quick reminder, today's event was recorded and you can access that recording through the registration link. Uh, it will also be put up on the Kremble Research Institute YouTube channel. And feel free to pass the link along to anyone who might be interested and miss today's event. And if you're excited to keep learning about opportunities in STEM, I encourage you to check out UHN STEM Pathways, a Toronto-based student outreach program that gives youth of all backgrounds the opportunity to learn and explore STEM with leaders in the field. You can find them at uhnstempathways.ca. And also please check out my research podcast as well, The Cram Podcast. It's available on all major streaming platforms and you can find out what brilliant scientists are doing across the country. And on a final personal note, uh, I just hope that if you're a student and you're watching today that you felt inspired about what you saw and heard. There are so many big problems uh, to solve in today's world, and you are the leaders of tomorrow. And science, I think, is truly one of the best ways to make a meaningful contribution. So don't just step back, get involved, join groups and clubs and uh, that align with your interests. You can meet people, you can explore ideas and try new things. Um, so many ways to get involved in science. And as Amina said earlier, think big, dream even bigger, and follow your passion. Thank you for watching.